I was told you all want to apply to medical school and become physicians. <laughs> well, I hope that's true, because if we're talking about the future of healthcare, we're going to be able to bring you the tools and resources to be your own physician. Imagine that healthcare future. So let's talk about what that future might look like and the principles that we're going to work towards. We want a better patient experience. We want better access. We want less waiting time. If you're your own doctor, hopefully you don't have to wait very long. We want to do it at less cost. We want a better provider experience. Today, 44% of doctors experience burnout. And we know when they do that, they don't take as good care of us as they should. And then finally, we want better outcomes. So how do we get there in the future? Well, one way is through personalized or precision medicine. And what does that mean? It means we're going to be able to collect a lot of information on you that we never had before. And that's going to not only allow us to take care of your illness and diseases better, but get to a place where we can actually prevent illness and disease to begin with, to let you live longer with a better quality of life. And that brings us to a concept of scientific wellness, the science of being well, and that is the future of healthcare. So how do we get there? Will we pull out the Star Trek tricorder? We already have that with us. We have all sorts of sensors. Many of you might be wearing Fitbits or iWatches right now that can collect steps, your sleep-wake cycle. But we can do a lot more already. And in the future, not only are you going to wear these devices, some of them will be attached to you, some of them will be implanted in you. And then some of them are going to be in the environment collecting information on your health 24-7 in a passive way you won't even know. But we'll have all this amazing data that will help us make better decisions about you. We'll also have your personal blueprint, your DNA. And why is that important? Because when I appreciate the building blocks of you as an individual, I can begin to see the diseases that you might be predisposed to. But even more exciting than that is we can begin to see what kinds of therapies or drugs that might work on you, and maybe even more importantly, the ones that won't, the ones that might cause you a serious side effect. We'll know that before you even take your first dose. Imagine living in a world where you never have a side effect from a medication again, or you never have a serious interaction because we've already figured that out for you before you took your therapy. We know that telehealth is going to bring better access. There's one healthcare organization in the U.S. that said by next year, 50% of their patients are going to access primary care through a device like this, an iPad, or a computer. Wow, 50%. Sometimes we think about telehealth as just that interaction, but I'd like to explain to you the concept of telepresence. There's a lot more that goes on in a visit than just that interaction. There are tools that we can use remotely where the patient is and also where the provider is. And those things might be devices or diagnostic tools, but sometimes they're people, other professionals, they could be your friends and family that we can engage to help take care of you. And that's going to require a different set of skills down the road. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh-oh. This looks like a pug dog being uh, flown around by a drone. Well. What is this about? I'm not interested in a drone flying a pug dog, but think about 
what drones could do with regards to changing access to health care, particularly in rural areas. I want to get you thinking about this concept of care wherever you are. <laughs> Through drones, if you get sick and you're two and a half hours away from help, we could drone out to you a diagnostic kit. Through telepresence, you could be instructed on how to use that. Let's say you have some kind of heart problem and we're going to send you out a portable ultrasound unit. We'll instruct you how to use it. That data will instantaneously get back to a provider and they can say, you know what? You don't need to move. But we're going to drone out to you a set of therapies that you need to apply and then you'll be okay. We've just saved a bunch of money. We saved you potentially the danger of travel while you're sick, and we've taken care of you where you are. Imagine being on the road at a rest area and getting sick. How would you get help? Through a drone, we could get you help pretty darn quickly. And I'll take you one step further. What if we had drones that could actually fly you to a place if you had some kind of urgent or critical need, or fly a provider out to you if you couldn't be moved? Wow. Okay, we got to take it up a notch. I'm going to show you a short video that's going to have four technologies. I'm going to begin to talk about them, and uh, let's see what we have here. The first thing is semi-autonomous robotic surgery. This is robotic surgery with minimal involvement from a human being, but we are moving towards fully autonomous robotic surgery. Imagine going to a surgery where a doctor never touches you. The next thing we're looking at is augmented reality. Physicians can now use augmented reality to help them with a computer overlay over the real scenario so that they know exactly what to do. This is a little bit of a demonstration of artificial intelligence. Think IBM Watson. The ability to have supercomputers, which we all have one in our pocket with our phones, the ability to have something like Watson to help us diagnose conditions and recommend the best treatment plans, that is in part going to get you to be able to take care of yourself in the future. And lastly, you saw a video of what we call a digestible sensor, a sensor you swallow that can then give us information about your inner workings. When before, all we could do is maybe open you up to get that information. Now we can give you a pill and get it. Holy cow. Let's say you get sick and you have some significant organ damage. Right now, your only option is to get a transplant. But what you're looking at on the screen is the future. It's a 3D organ printer. And pretty soon, we're going to have the capability to make a customizable organ that is exactly like yours. Wow. I want to talk about social media, and you're like, holy cow, we thought social media was bad for your health. But it can also be used for good. Veterinarians in other countries are able to use social media to track the health of livestock. And when livestock get ill, their owners start to text and post to social media, and veterinarians can actually track those texts on social media and then figure out what's wrong with herds and then intervene before the sickness spreads. Imagine using social media for human beings in that same way. We could do it. So I've just given you a small glimpse into some of the potential future of healthcare, but let's talk a little bit now how we're going to get all of you there because you're going to end up taking care of yourself because after this, you're all going to be physicians. <laughs> so what might you have to do? Well, if you're going to be learning from computers and computers are going to be an integral part of the healthcare process, then maybe you might need to learn how to code. 
And if you say coding's too hard, well, you should at least know how a computer crunches data and what the algorithms mean. Because you know what happens? Right now, physicians use about 15 pieces of data to help you get better. But in the future, we're not going to have 100 or 1,000 or 100,000. We're going to have a million data points on each and every one of you. How do we figure out which ones are the important ones? We're going to have to get better at that. If we're going to be using telehealth, there is an art to communicating emotion and compassion across a video medium. It's not like we're doing right now where I can look you in the eye, I can see your smile or your frown or your tiredness. It's harder to do that. So maybe the clinicians of the future need acting classes. Maybe. You better all start preparing. If we're going to be printing 3D organs, maybe our future clinicians need to understand a little bit about graphic design and how 3D printers work today, their limitations and their capabilities. So as we're designing organs of the future, we'll know what we're up against. If we're going to involve more people in the team, we have to be better leaders, and we have to know how to work together as a team. And lastly, if we're going to be flying pug dogs around in drones <laughs> or bringing you medical supplies and therapies and using social media to help track disease and illness, maybe it's not too far-fetched to think that the trainees of today need to work with video games and need to involve simulation. Today, what we know about surgeons who do laparoscopic, laparoscopic surgery is that if they practice 10 minutes before they go into the surgical room on a laparoscopic simulator or a video game, you will have a 25% better outcome in your procedure. I want all my surgeons to be playing video games. If we're going to get to this place where you're your own physician someday, there's a lot of ethical questions we have to answer. Let me just throw out a few. If we're going to use artificial intelligence to tell us what to do, when do human beings get involved? If we can make organs on demand, is it okay that we abuse our organs because we know there's a replacement right around the corner? And if it's true that sharing our personal data could improve the health of our neighbors or ourselves, might we think differently about the privacy of our data and whether or not it should only be ours? Well, you guys have been uh, great applicants and uh, I'm sure you're going to get into medical school someday. Thank you very much.